Welcome, my name is Harald Sack. And I'm Sasha Bruns. And this is Knowledge Graph, lecture number two, basic knowledge graph infrastructure. What we are talking about today is we talk about how to identify and access things. For this, Sasha, let me ask you one question. What is this? I always thought it was an apple. Are you sure? I am pretty sure. Okay, now let me ask you this. What is that? Uh, that's also an apple. So then what's the difference? I have no idea. No idea? No. So I can tell you, this is not an apple. What's this? Yeah, what is it? I guess it's an image of an apple. So then why did you say it's an apple? I don't know. You don't know? It's pretty amazing. If we look at that, we see that as humans, we are able to identify things by a mere concept or by, let's say, a mere symbol. We see a symbol, we hear a symbol, and then we can really identify the thing for which exactly, for which object the symbol stands for. And this is also something we want to enable the computer to do. But you might ask now how to do that. Of course, we need something like that if we want the computer to understand what we are saying. And this is exactly what we are after in this lecture. So therefore, how do we do this on the web? Yes, to distinguish one apple from another apple on the web and also from any other resource, we need a uniform resource identifier. A, U a URI defines a simple and extensible schema for worldwide unique identification of abstract or physical resources. Think of it as about the street numbers. Um, similar to that, when the street identifies a specific location, URI identifies a specific resource on the web. On the other hand, an internationalized resource identifier, or IRI, is an extension of the URI that expands the set of permitted characters to most Unicode characters. Um, similar to uh, multicultural cities, where sometimes in the street names you can also see non-Latin letters, um, IRIs allows for more uh, diverse language and character characteristics of the resource. Uh, both URI and IRI con consist of four main components. First comes the schema, which identifies the protocol, where the, uh, how to access the resource. It is followed by the domain or the host, basically the web server that is hosting the resource. The path identifies a resource itself, and of course we have a fragment. If required, we can also uh, access a specific section of the resource. So everything seems to be clear. There's only one question left. What is actually this resource we are talking about? Yeah, on the web, usually what we know is resources are documents. But we want to talk about this here, about apples. So how do I get an apple to the, uh, to the web? We know apples are not on the web, but there might be, of course, descriptions of such thing. So thereby, a resource that we can identify might be everything everything which has a clear identity, of course, in the context of our application. So it might be not only an apple, it might also be a web page, a book, a location, a person, relations, everything you can think of. Of course, there are also URIs for established things, like for example, on the web we are using URLs, the Uniform Recourse Location. So these are really addresses for web documents. And there are other things outside the web, like for example, for, for books, you have these ISBN numbers or ISSN numbers for journals. And you have also digital object identifiers to identify things in, uh, in the digital world. So URI is pretty well established. Okay, however, a URL, again, to differentiate it from URI, identifies what exists on the web. So it's the documents. And URI uh, identifies on the web what exists. And you can see here down, this is pretty, th they're pretty different. Okay, so let's talk about URI, which resides here in the lower level, in the web platform level of the Semantic Web Technology stack. Okay, Sasha, would this be then the right URI for our Apple? Let me take a look. So we have schema, we have a domain, and we have a resource, which is an Apple. Sounds proper for me. What do you say about that one? It also likes an, looks like an appropriate URI. I'm not sure. Look at that one. Okay. It's a, I think they're different things. 
but it's all an apple, isn't it? Yes, it is. So should we have different identifiers for the same thing? I'm not sure. I don't think we should. How then we distinguish? Yeah, but let me ask you now the more pressing question, because there are more things named apple. What about that one? I don't know. So we could, um, perhaps, is there, is there a solution for this question? There might be a solution. So let's have a look at the next slide. Another solution to identify the things in the web would be to provide um, language-independent URIs. For example, numbers. Similar to Wikidata, as you, you can see here down, um, it uses its famous QIDs or Q numbers to identify things and also to distinguish uh, between things that have similar or the same names. For example, here we can see that Apple is identified as Q89. However, the Apple, Apple the company, is having a completely different Q number, Q312, so Q312, because they are different things. Exactly, and if we are using numbers instead of names, we are not dependent on any kind of language. So the numbers would be exactly the same, no matter whether we are talking in French, in Chinese, or in English. Yes, but what is actually about the names? Where are they saved? Of course, having a language-independent URI doesn't mean that information about their actual names are lost. Yes, while via labelization to provide labels in different languages with different languages, la language tags, we can also say that it's never mind how, um, how the thing or the resource is called or the sounds, we still refer to the same thing. Okay. To sum it up what exactly we are doing here, we are using a so-called designator, which is something which is not the thing itself, because the Apple itself cannot be on the web, that's clear. But we have a resource that describes an Apple. That's the so-called designator, and that one that is described is the so-called designator. Furthermore, we have the URI, which identifies the resource, the designatum itself, it identifies the apple by a URI. However, the information that is then given back when I access this URI is some representation of the designator, which gives you metadata, for example, given here in terms of some uh, HTML code that describes exactly what the apple is. So that might seem a bit complicated, but in fact, that's not so complicated at all. If you want to, uh, let's say, replicate or uh, simulate exactly this kind of process, process on the web, you can do this with so-called HTTP content negotiation. You remember HTTP was the hypertext transfer protocol, and there is a thing like content negotiation, and this exactly distinguishes between designator and designatum. So both of them are complete separate things. Therefore, the designator and the designatum also should have different URIs. Which means, if you want to talk about the thing about the apple, or if you want to talk about the data that is represented about the apple, you need two URIs. Two URIs for designator and designatum. And how this works, Sasha is going to explain to you. Yeah, let's take a look at the example. Let's, let's say we would like to have information about the apple from Wikidata. And this information, we want to have it in the human um, readable form. So we need an HTML file. For it, it's pretty easy. We, cont we contact or we ne negotiate with um, uh, our server with HTTP via request and say, given this um, resource, yes, which is our apple q89 we would like to have information about it in html this kind of ura is um, also called designatum and what what happens next after the um, the web server answers us that okay i see the request and it searches for the uri in the requested format and of course here you can see that it is now a different uri which is called designator what happens next? The server returns uh, the request and says, OK, here, look, here's your uh, required URI, and this is an HTML document. Similarly, we can also ask for any other formats like that. 
let's say we have um, we want to have a machine understandable information about the same apple from Wikidata, and the process is exactly the same. First of all, we um, write the request to the web server. We, we, we have the same resource with the same, ident um, with the same identifier, yes, Q89, and say that we want to have it in the turtle format, yes, in the machine readable format. This URI is called designatum. Um, after, the, after receiving the request, the web server answers, OK, I see your request, and he and searches for the URI with a required, in a required format. And this URI is in a designator. It returns the request and provides an RDF document. Turtle, the format what we used there, is a way to encode RDF, and we will talk about it closely later in the lecture. But um, it still sounds a bit uh, theoretical. Let's try it out ourselves. Uh, so curl for it, we will use a curl comment. Um, in, and this is a client URL, the, um, the way to um, negotiate with your web server. For it, I would just open my terminal and past there the, um, the request. So you can see here, it's basically the similar what we have the on, the, on, the, on the slides. We contact the web server and ask to provide an HTML version of this resource or the app. And as you can see, the HTML file is returned. So we have all the information about Apple there. Similar to this, we can also ask for the turtle representation or machine re uh, understandable representation of the information about the Apple. And after request, we see the turtle file, which is coming in there. So it's pretty easy. Try it out yourselves. OK. If we step up then in the web platform that is the ground layer of the semantic web technology stack, of course, all of this information then is transported via HTTP. We have seen this just now with content negotiation. What is next is, of course, we have to encode the message, the information we want to pass. And this then is done in RDF, which is the resource description framework, which is then the subject of our next lecture.